And with that, let's go ahead and kick it off and talk about governance this morning. Governance and conservation districts. This is a term that many of you have probably heard tossed around for a while. What does it really mean? And what does it mean for district staff? So governance is the action or manner of governing. That's according to Webster. That's Webster's dictionary's definition of that. Really useful sometimes, right? How Webster defines things. But my working definition is that governance is a system and structure of district management based on clear understandings of roles and responsibilities and great policies in place. It's really an intrinsic part of any organization that has a governing board. It's a vital component of organizational success, not only for districts, but for the commission as well. Any government entity or NGO that has a governing board structure can benefit from strong governance. We'll talk specifically about conservation districts today. A handful of districts have already traveled this road in establishing their own governance structures. And a number of districts are now considering having this conversation at their district as well. In fact, the commission rolled out a governance and public official conduct module last fall uh, for supervisors because it is a high priority topic for districts to address in their operations. So what does governance mean to a district? It's typically realized through established policies and procedures that members of an organization follow. This means both board and staff. And the first important component of governance is clear sideboards. So board and staff roles and responsibilities are clear. So all understand their lane. Continuity. Board members and staff members change over time, and a solid governance structure provides continuity through that turnover so that each time uh, someone in your organization changes, you don't have to take three steps back. You don't have to recreate the wheel. Consistency, that governance provides a roadmap, and it helps to ensure all are working to fulfill their proper roles within the organization. Um, and transparency. So not only do board and staff within the district have a clear understanding of organizational functionality, those roles and responsibilities, but so does the public, your partners and your customers. Accountability. When it's clear who's responsible for the different functions within an organization, it is far easier to hold each other accountable. It's more difficult to shirk duties or tasks or blame others. Fairness. Without a governance structure in place, it can feel like every person for themselves. And that can be difficult working environment to work within. So let's take just a moment and think about governance from the board perspective. I want you to walk in a board member's shoes for just a moment why do you think governance would be important to you as a board member? And think about a calamity that strong governance might help you avoid. If you happen to have that piece of paper and a pencil or a pen handy, jot something down there. Think about governance from the board member's perspective. All right, I'll share a couple things that I've seen that you may or may not have jotted down. Let's say a fellow board member is uh, interacting directly with staff to give direction, uh, maybe making promises, going around the manager or the executive director, uh, basically generating uncertainty, confusion, and mistrust. This is a common trap. It can happen to anyone. What about a fellow board member uh, is contacted by a staff member at your district and that staff member is worried about their upcoming performance evaluation? The board member responds to this staff person with kind words and kudos for a job well done, says not to worry, trying to be supportive, 
when in fact maybe that manager or executive director has been dealing with a performance issue with that person for some time. That's another easy trap to step into. Strong governance can help alleviate and mitigate those traps that you might run, it, run up against as a board member. Now as a member of staff, so put your shoes back on. Why would governance be important to you? Can you think of a calamity that strong governance can help to avoid from your perspective as staff? So I'm going to give you just a moment. Got something down if you have that piece of paper. All right. Let me share some possible calamities uh, that you may or may not have jotted down. So let's say different board members on your district board are giving you direction on what or how to do your job that is in conflict with your direct boss's direction right, the, the danger of multiple bosses. And so then you feel like you have to please many bosses that are giving you those differing directions. This can easily happen when nobody knows their lane. I've been in this role, not at the commission, but I've worked for governing boards for some time. And, and I call this working in the meat grinder. It's, it's not fun. Another scenario, another possible calamity might be that you don't feel like there's any recourse or process open to you if you have a complaint to ensure you're heard and your issue receives proper attention. It's sit down and shut up or you risk your job. I've heard that before. Some of you may have too. Governance provides the structure to ensure due process, due diligence, and fair treatment of all staff. What about lack of fairness? A lack of governance could mean preferential treatment or favoritism of staff and a culture of competition for support for your job or your program from superiors, including board members. It could cause emotional turmoil and uncertainty that can be very stressful. In general, Chaos can reign uh, in the efforts by board and staff. They might be disorganized. They might conflict with each other. Uh, general overall reduced organizational effectiveness, right? More time and money is spent trying to right wrongs, soothe internal strife, resolve drama, than you actually might be spending getting conservation on the ground, which is the key core principle of, of all districts, right? So from the staff perspective, strong governance can really be beneficial to you. It's a two-way street. Governance is very much a two-way street. There are two sides. Board members and staff have to embrace a strong governance structure and then work within that structure to be successful. If individual board members or staff members disregard, reject, or actively work against district policies and procedures, it's not only inappropriate, it's damaging to the district as an overall organization. In some cases, it could be illegal. We hope that's not happening, but it always could, and can cause unnecessary expenses, such as a lawsuit involving the district. It just feels like plain sabotage of the organization when both the board and the staff aren't committed to governing the district and following what you establish as governance. So I want you to take another moment back to that piece of paper and your pen and jot down one thing that you could do as a conservation district staff member to help your district be successful through strong governance. And then hold on to that piece of paper. We're gonna come back to that in just a little bit, okay? So jot down one thing that you could do better as a member of district staff to help your district be successful through strong governance. Now I can talk about governance all day long. I've talked about governance with districts, with national organizations, at the commission, I want you to hear some feedback and experiences 
from your fellow district managers, from folks just like you. With that, I want to turn the mic over to Sarah Moorhead first to share with you some of her experiences with governance. So Sarah, are you with us this morning? Yeah, good morning, Shauna. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I think most of the folks uh, that are with us this morning on this call, um, you know, have some awareness of, of why I'm probably presenting in this session. Um, for those of you that don't, uh, all of the calamities and more that Shauna mentioned earlier in her presentation uh, occurred at Thurston CD uh, between about 2017 and 2019, uh, and things got into a really bad state. And so I wanted to share some of the lessons um, that we've learned as an organization and that I've really come to value um, and, and feel is really important carrying forward in this next chapter of who we are in hopes that it will help all of you. Uh, presented because I want to share of my authentic. Um, so I apologize. I am going to the chat with a thanks. Uh, be helpful. I think the biggest uh, sort of uh, that I think we all can balance ability government um, is really the um, piece of. Um, Certainly, there's develop policies and put a foundation, governance culture, and when your organization is remote. So, every is hearing this and says, Me, because we're in sort of um, hot water right now, this actually is for you. Um, now is the time to sort of lift the foundation, do all of that ground uh, before you actually. Yeah, have a situation and, and you have a scenario where you have to pull out, um, you know, those really clear guidelines and roles and responsibilities that Shauna had mentioned. Um, I think I've heard a lot, you know, in I've been with Thurston CD for a little over 10 years, and I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it's all about the policy. Uh, really understand why and why that was relevant and needed those policies. They weren't there, or they weren't enough. They we're missing some pieces. Um, oh, it looks like my audio. Uh, can you hear me? We are getting a little bit of broken audio, Sarah. Let's do a test. Uh, is it any better now? Yes, it does sound better now. Awesome. You never know between the cell phone and the computer and the Wi-Fi and the 4G or whatever else they're planning, uh, what's going to be the best. So let's try from here. I apologize, everybody. Um, but mostly I'm, I'm just sharing that um, why those policies are really important. Um, it's hard to imagine what things might be in the future. Um, and so I would, uh, one of the things that really helped us was reaching out to other districts um, that might have experienced challenges in the past. Um, and now we're certainly continuing to keep our eyes on other types of policy development and other scenarios that are happening at other districts because you never know when we're going to draw the short straw and something's going to happen again at Thurston CD and we want to be really prepared. So looking into those types of policies as they're being developed, sharing amongst ourselves as districts, and making sure that we're really updating those and putting those really clear roles and responsibilities in writing um, is just such a great piece. Good, I'm glad my audio is, is working better now. Um, and really addressing the what if. So one of the things I found about um, our policies prior at Thurston CD is that they really just said, what are we doing right now? Um, but they didn't address what happens if X, Y, or Z takes place? What happens if something changes? What happens if the policies um, are, are violated in some way? What happens if the policies fail? 
Uh, and those types of pathways and creating those channels within each of our policies um, is really important. And those are, are the most effective components of the policy um, when there's challenge and when there's, when there's stress and struggle or when there's different interpretations of the policy, um, really having those pieces and continuing to look at them and make sure that it still makes sense for everybody. We experienced a lot of turnover within our organization over the last couple of years. Um, we have almost an entirely new staff now um, from the staff that we had in 2017 and almost an entirely new board. And so a lot of the things, the institutional knowledge um, is no longer there and a lot of the documents and policies and procedures and things that were created were created um, with, with a team of humans that interpreted it one way um, but are no longer with the organization. And so we ran into a lot of scenarios where things were vague or they didn't make sense. Uh, and so cleaning those pieces up has been really helpful. Um, also making sure that there's balances of power. Um, and so again, putting that into your policy, but also creating a really good governance culture and customs and respect for those specific roles and responsibilities creates that balance of power. And that's, you know, between the board, the staff, and the district manager, um, and also within the board itself, you know, making sure that um, we have these great officer positions and folks to take on additional responsibility or demonstrate leadership, but that there's not one individual um, that is really taking lead of the district or making decisions independently or outside of these board meetings. Um, it is a really great piece, uh, making sure that when meetings are called, there's consensus amongst the board as a new concept from formerly, um, you know, the, the board chair at our district could call a meeting, a special meeting at any point in time without any of the other supervisors, um, you know, involvement or any of the staff involvement. And so um, these types of things that you can sort of lay down a more inclusive, understanding of this is how we're going to do business. We're going to make sure that all of the players on the team that need to be there to conduct business well um, are able to be there, are able to participate, um, and that we're going to move forward with some predictability. We put a lot of work into those types of roles and responsibilities, understanding who can spend money at the district, who can initiate contracts, you know, not um, it, it's, a, it's the board as a whole that votes and initiates a contract. The executive director can initiate certain types of contracts. Um, you know, it's, it's not individual supervisors. And so that was something that we didn't have reflected in policy, but we do now because that situation occurred. Um, the other thing, too, is this is really the time that your organization's ethics and morals can be really clearly reflected in the way you do business, making sure that um, you're setting that bar high for how you want to operate as an organization in the community, um, also internally with your staff, at board meetings, between board and staff members, really thinking and being intentional about that um, and putting that down in writing, understanding what that is, understanding what that means, and making sure that that training and that information is brought immediately to, to new members of the organization, board or staff. Um, and, and those backstops, those consequences for breaking policy, um, you know, what happens if it fails? Again, I just want to reiterate that those systems, having those in place is really important. What happens if, um, you know, uh, a, a board member tries to um, initiate a contract outside of a board meeting? You know, how, what's the process to address that? What happens if, um, you know, the executive director, um, you know, uh, agrees to um, do work specifically for one supervisor um, and it's not a shared mission or a shared strategic goal of the organization or a shared direction from the board as a whole. You know, what's the process for addressing that? So um, I think we left a lot of that in the past up to, well, we'll have conversation when that happens. You know, we'll, we'll take each unique situation as it comes and we will um, sort of address them on a case-by-case -case basis. But what we didn't have was really how, how do we address that? What does the framework look like? Um, what is that process? And so a couple of pieces 
you know, that I would definitely share that we've put in there into our policy is um, things like the Dispute Resolution Center, um, you know, making sure that we are, uh, have that sort of backstop. We have um, meetings between uh, the district manager and the board chair. The board chair meets with the rest of the supervisors. The board chair then meets with the executive director. Um, the executive director has not just a standard annual evaluation, but has a mid-year evaluation and a check-in. Um, it's just creating those, those systems and those frameworks, putting those into policy, and then making sure that you're following that policy explicitly. I guess that would be a, another, uh, put a gold star next to that one, is follow you, your policies uh, explicitly. Um, unfortunately, if any of um, the challenges or, or complications that occur at any of your districts ever end up um, in litigation, uh, following your policies explicitly is that great legal foundation that is going to make or break a lot of those scenarios and situations. Um, so again, uh, we've updated things like our board travel policy and reimbursement. We had um, challenges in the past where uh, board members were, were traveling for things that were not really related specifically to the core functions of the district and looking for reimbursement. Um, and so that's something we've worked with the state auditor's office to get really good policies and sidebars around that. Um, the other thing I would really mention is legal counsel has been really helpful for us, um, especially in, in the, you know, when things start to break down or things start to go wrong, but it's also really great on the preventative end, um, guidance for operations um, within meetings, how to make certain types of decisions or conduct certain types of legal processes like, you know, procurement and contracting, um, helping to develop those policies and look for those what-if scenarios, having additional legal eyes on that is really helpful in making those recommendations. Uh, certainly being able to have access to your own private legal counsel is great um, and, and affords, you know, even more um, uh, ability to have those folks in the room during a lot of these meetings. Um, but it, Endurus is helpful, too. Um, they definitely specialize in employment law. They help with any sort of claims um, related to employment law and personnel, which is helpful. And the policy development piece um, is another is another component. And um, when there's challenges that arise, you know, sometimes they're able to provide um, some help and support and some guidance for policy discrepancies. MRSD is another one that folks know and use often, um, and that definitely helps from the state uh, law perspective. You know, are we following the OPMA? Um, are we uh, understanding appropriate legal and ethical considerations in our policies? Are we, um, you know, following all of those great state laws? They've got tons of resources and examples of policies, um, and they also help uh, with some of the policy development pieces too. Um, you know, they can definitely uh, give additional recommendations uh, that help limit risk and risky behaviors. Um, and uh, the other thing I would mention too is is having their sort of guidance outside of policy development or private legal counsel or endurance uh, for any action-based advice too, not just paper policy development. But in this scenario, under this context, um, you know, do you have a recommendation? Is there something that I should consider? But looking outward has really helped us gain a lot of perspective. And I think I'll, I'll wrap up with um, mental health and morale is so important. Um, and that was a really big take home uh, that we learned over the years, um, over these last couple of years, um, really making sure that we are adhering to ethical conduct, um, that we're creating an intentional workplace culture, that we have commitment to consistency and support, that our staff, when they enter our doors, know what they're going to expect, they know how they're going to be treated, they know what appropriate behavior looks like, um, we've adopted and are staying uh, really committed to a zero tolerance policy for bullying and harassment um, that's internally and externally focusing in and that really needs that policy backbone in writing. Um, it really needs commitment from the board and the executive director 
uh, to, to make sure to be that safeguard. Um, and the other thing is work-life balance. I'm going to mention, take your leave, take your vacations that you accrue, take your sick leave and use it. Um, encourage the use of leave, encourage the use of mental health as an appropriate use of sick leave. Um, that was one that I think really saved a lot of our um, staff at the district during our challenging time. Um, we did lose about half of our staff during that time uh, period where we were struggling, um, but encouraging mental health as an appropriate use of sick leave. I'm just going to repeat that because there's a stigma around that and there shouldn't be. Um, preventative mental health leave as well as, um, you know, as, as well as treatment is, is really appropriate. The Washington State Employees Assistance Program is something that also has some services or through Department of Enterprise Services. I'll put all these links in the chat at the end too. Um, but there's some some opportunities for staff to participate or take advantage of counseling services and other things um, if if private services are not available or the employee does not have those um, they do other types of mediation and and support both in sort of the professional context but also in their personal lives um, and so i would mention setting boundaries is a really good one um, not just work-life boundaries um, but also boundaries for how um, you want to be treated as a as a working professional and draw those hard lines. And if you're in a bad situation, again, reach out. Um, the Dispute Resolution Center, I mentioned before, they do great proactive trainings. We're going to do an organizational-wide um, conflict resolution training for all of our staff this summer through the through our local Dispute Resolution Center. Um, but they also offer mediation services that really are fair for everyone. They take into account um, you know, all of the, all sides of that story and, and create conversation. And so rather than letting issues um, sort of snowball and become bigger, they help you address them really timely and quickly and, and look for solutions where you can move forward, um, which is great. Um, the Human Rights Commission um, is another piece that's more of a claims base, but if you're, if you're looking for, I need support and I don't have it and I don't have someone to turn to, um, for organizations that are over 10, which doesn't include everybody, um, that's another component that I would just mention. Um, you know, and I would just share reaching out to one another, um, making sure that you're reaching out if you need help. Um, and this, believe believe it or not, this all relates to governance, I promise. <laughs> um, and especially if things go wrong, uh, but creating your network too, um, looking for the people um, that are out there that can support and provide you with advice um, and guidance and mentorship. Um, you know, many of those folks for me are on this call right now, Shauna being one of them. I think Mike Norton's on here and Tom Salzer and Craig Nelson. Um, you know, find those people um, that, that are, can help, can offer some guidance, can offer some perspective, can share some resources, um, you know, I know that all of those people and many more made a huge impact during one of the darkest times that I've had, you know, in my life um, during some of these organizational crisis moments. Um, but I would also mention look out for those people that are, um, you know, sort of struggling. Reach out to your sister district if you know that there's some, some strife over there and make sure that they don't need an extra set of, of, of helping hands or, or some sort of templates. Some, um, or even just a listening ear, someone to, to debrief and, and, and digress. Um, and then I would just say, looking at rebuilding, I think um, governance is a lot of, you know, what happens next? Things have broken, we've, we've resolved. Um, we want to build, we want to improve. Maybe they haven't broken, but we're looking to, to make a shift. Um, what do we do? Um, and it's just start piece by piece. Just, just make a start. Make sure you've got a good support team, both internally and again externally, reaching out to your community too and making sure that they're there for help. Um, keep a good handle on your cash flow. That's definitely something that we did. Be really conservative as you're regrowing. Uh, focusing on what you have and do it well and then focus on growth. Um, keeping your community needs and priorities in your forefront. That will help continue to um, get more support from your community. Um, and so we've done a lot of those things and have really 
committed to organizational growth since then. And we've, since 2019, we've doubled in staff. Um, we've doubled or almost doubled our budget, especially our grant revenue. We now have an in-house engineer and a uh, veterans restoration crew. We've tripled our cost share projects available to the community. Um, we have com competition for board engagement now. Uh, we also have great job recruitment response. We've built a, a house that people want to be in, you know, people want to work at. Um, our local jurisdictions are writing us into future plans as response mechanisms for solving problems like climate change and farmland preservation. Um, and they're developing, we're co-developing alternative revenue sources and looking to diversify, you know, that so that we have long-term stability. We're winning awards. Um, we've won District of the Year for Southwest Washington, awards at uh, 2020 WACD. We've been featured on the cover of local magazines within this last year and other various articles. Um, now we're looking at contracting uh, for a future conservation and education center. And so um, I just wanna share with folks that if things seem stressful, reach out to folks, keep going. And uh, yeah, I think Shauna has a lot more great things to share. So I will wrap up and um, know that I'm here for each and every one of you too. So if you ever need a, a, a sounding board or, um, you know, so, someone to talk to, uh, let me know. All right. Thanks so much, Shauna. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate you sharing that hard road that you and Thurston Conservation District traveled to come back around to your governance conversation. And you're right. You want to take the time now to put some policies in place while things are working well, while you're not faced with challenges, right? So let's pivot now. I wanna turn the mic over to Jennifer Bois, the Executive Director of the Palouse Conservation District. And Jennifer, how's your audio while I'm turning the baton over to you? I think we're connected. Does it sound okay on your end? Sounds great. And the presenter mode should be coming your way now. Okay, perfect. That sounds great. Yeah, so it's great to be with everybody today. Thanks so much for allowing us to share some of our experiences with governance and the importance that it's uh, it's made for our local districts. And you know, I one of the comments that Sarah just made about uh, being one of the darkest times in her life. You know, that's certainly something that we all want to avoid if we can. And we've probably all been there at some point, you know, had one of those really dark moments that, you know, or, or periods of our life and it's tied to work. And, um, you know, and it's and it's unfortunate because those of us who are working in uh, the district realm and uh, part of this conservation family, you know, really is a wonderful place to be, but um, things can get turned around in uh, pretty quick if you don't have the right structures in place. And so I know Palouse Conservation District has really benefited from doing a lot of governance work and a lot of that support has come from the commission in the last few years. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about why we thought it was important to do governance work, um, how we got to the point of really focusing on it and setting aside the time to do that. And then I really want to leave folks with um, just a tool that we found helpful to help keep our governance expectations fresh. So I'll, I'll walk folks through our annual board evaluation that we're doing that's based on our governance work. So Palouse Conservation District uh, for most of its existence was uh, relatively stable and it's only been in the past six years or so that there's been real rapid change and some of that came from rapid funding um, coming in from multiple sources uh, diversifying our funding portfolio and with that a lot of staff changes and hiring to bring on the staff that could complete the work um, following that we had a rapid evolution on our board like many boards across um, the state we had a lot of longstanding members, folks who had spent 10, 20, 30 years on the board uh, serving their community. 
And we still have some of those very long-standing members. Uh, Larry Cochran's our board chair, and we heard uh, Dean Longry talk about him being um, there at the foundation of what's been going on for conservation in the state for a very long time. Um, but in the last few years, we had a couple of our long-standing um, folks who had served 10 and 20 years retire off the board. And so we went from a situation where we had all of the board members working very closely together for many, many years to having a kind of a reborn district or a growing district that had a lot of change on the staff side, on the district organizational development side, and now uh, change on our board as we brought in new board members. And that's, that's the point where it became very clear to us that we needed to spend some time to work on our governance and um, put it, put structures in place that we were thinking about and really thoughtful of. Um, we took a lot of the lessons that we had learned um, over the past years, and we we looked at what the resources were to us out there. And one thing that really stood out, you know, I've heard other districts talk. Um, I really appreciated when WACD brought Aspen Group in to talk about governance a few years ago. And we've heard Enduras talk at Wade and at other engagements about governance. And then to really see the commission put some resources behind it was um, super helpful. The modules that have been developed, um, we've gone through all of them with our board. But one thing that kept jumping out to, to the board and I is that there really is a standard um, set of best management practices for all boards, whether it's a conservation district board, a nonprofit board, or other governing bodies. The best practices really um, are pretty similar. And so we started reviewing those best practices. And some of the things that we really wanted to make sure that we talked about was the importance of roles distinction, as you've heard earlier. Um, really making sure that there was an understanding of how the board was going to operate and operate as a single unit with the, all the board making action uh, by official motion uh, not having individual board members um, have any kind of power within the organization, but the power coming from the board as a, uni a unified entity. Uh, we're also realizing the importance of setting policy that would keep all of um, the work that was being done for at the policy level objective. And we wanted to make sure that we had all those expectations in place for both board members and staff members. So at the end of the day, we could all do what we got into this work to do is put more conservation on the ground. And so I think emphasizing that to everybody is if you have a good, strong, solid foundation, um, and as Sarah mentioned, you know, you can be ready for the challenges in the future when they come, because they will come. Then you can have a structure in place that can support you to keep your eye on the North Star, which is really conserving natural resources and making sure that that's where most of our energy is going. So a couple of the steps that we took um, in our governance journey is... Uh, we started, like I mentioned, with the board conversations, um, reviewing those lessons learned over the years, uh, reviewing those best management practices for governance, and then establishing our own governance policies. And many folks would say, okay, great, you did that. That's, that's probably where you stopped, but that's really where we started. <laughs> Once you get the policies in place, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to keep those fresh. And um, that's kind of what I wanna leave folks with is the importance of keeping those governance expectations fresh. So um, in addition to setting those governance policies, then we, um, Shauna was actually very generous with her time. She did a staff governance workshop for us. And that was really helpful um, because you can set policies, you can even have all of your policies out there for everybody to view, but actually walking through the governance policies with staff and making sure that they spent time reviewing them together and had an opportunity to uh, present questions and discussion was really important. And I'll just say right up front, not every staff person liked every governance policy that was set. Um, some folks had gotten used to a different system of interacting um, or liked having a looser structure. But what we were going for at the end of the day is that those roles and responsibilities, uh, those sideboards, as Shauna mentioned, that they were out there, they were bright, 
and there was transparency and everybody knew um, the governance structure that was in place. And so I would really recommend, uh, you know, we talk about governance a lot at the board level, but making sure that the staff's involved and, and understands where the governance work is important and then also has the opportunity to review those governance policies. And then, Jennifer, um, yeah, sure. If I, could, if I could break in real quickly, I want to make sure that if we are or not having a technical glitch. Um, are you showing us slides right now? Because I think we're having a little delay with those coming through. Nope, not yet, but I was just about to. Okay, good. So yes, I just have a slide for my last, the last piece that I want to leave folks with here, which is about Ooh, the- okay, board. we haven't missed anything. <laughs> right on. Just right checking. On, pressing the button now. So hopefully you will be able to see my screen soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. And Shauna, maybe you could just confirm um, if you can see the board evaluation dashboard at this point. I'm going to lean on Alyssa, too, who may have stronger internet. Yep, I see your desktop coming up. So here we go. Okay. So yeah, so the last piece um, after doing the, the staff workshop and establishing those governance policies was actually keeping it alive and uh, doing a regular review so that we could reflect on how the board was operating. Um, so what you see in front of you is our the 2020 board evaluation dashboard. This is not Palouse Conservation District's actual uh, data. This is data that I made up for our presentation today. So that's why you should be able to see the Wade uh, logo there on the dashboard. Mm, and just see your desktop still, Jennifer. Oh boy, well that's a mess. You don't want to see that. Let's try this. Is that better? Can you see that it says 2020 yes, board? Yes, but it's, uh, it's small, very small for me. Oh, boy. There we'll we go. Okay on my end. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, great. Just want to make sure folks could see it. Thanks, Jennifer. Great. Yeah, so this is the tool that we put together. Um, we have three different sections of this board evaluation and that we put together and um, they are around governing commitments and policy adherence board code of conduct and board purpose and what we found really helpful with um, this dashboard is we asked each board member to participate in a survey um, that went through all of the items in our governance um, uh, the, the main items in our governance policy and rate the board's performance based on the whole board performance, not individual board members. Um, so I think that's important going back to that single unit of control. And I think this really gave folks time to reflect on their role as a board member and how the board was working. So I'm not going to walk through all these items because they would be set based on um, whatever governance policies you put in place, but I will just show you that pulling this together and making sure that uh, the board had time to review those policies and procedures. There's a link right here so that they can get to our, the policies and procedures quickly. Um, and then there's some great metrics that we were able to pull together so that they could see the actual feedback and um, link to the actual incoming survey data, um, as well as some of the comments that were coming in. And also, you'll see here a low confidence report. So any board member that um, said disagree or strongly disagree, all of their comments are collected in a way alongside their survey responses. So you can really drill down into the governance um, data and why folks felt that the board was or was uh, was performing well or was not performing well. Um, and then in ours, you can look through response by evaluation category, as I mentioned. So um, having those governing commitments and policy adherence, you can see some of the items here that were based, pulling them directly out of our governance um, policies. And then moving down, um, you know, you can see we have quite a few items. I think we have 12 items in that first section. Um, then we go into the board code of conduct. And in that section, um, we have about 17 items that we're asking folks to, to review. And then finally, um, moving into the board purpose, um, we have just these three items here. And so this is um, uh, something that I've built within Smartsheet. I'm happy to share it um, 
it was a nice way to make the survey easy you know there's a form that comes with it so the board can actually just take the survey and as they take the survey um, all of their responses come in and feed live into this dashboard where where the board could kind of dig down into uh, performance from the year and so that's that's really um where i guess i'm probably just about out of time but i just want to leave folks with the importance of an engaging annual board evaluation to really keep that governance expectation fresh um, making sure that folks are diving in reviewing their governance policies it's one thing to pass them um, but then if you don't keep it fresh you're only unfortunately looking back at your policies when there's problems so i think um, for us the board evaluation was a really good opportunity for us to also see things that need to be revised and reflect on um, what we had passed and what those roles and those expectations were so with that i'm happy to share this with anybody um, i'll also put the uh, offer out there that shauna and sarah have made that i'm available if anybody wants to call and talk about um, governance and um i've also benefited from many of the same uh, mentors that are on here and it definitely is a journey um, so i really appreciate everyone being here today and i'm going to pass it back to shauna thanks so much jennifer really appreciate that those remarks and that great view at your board evaluation dashboard another another super cool smart sheet tool so let's go back to our sheet of paper for a moment where we may have jotted down what we could do uh, as a member of staff or for our board members joining us today, what can we do as a board member? What are we willing to do to help our districts be successful through strong governance? So um, we'll take a brief moment. If anyone would like to share uh, what they jotted down, feel free to drop that in the questions box. Or if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute you if you want to share that verbally. Okay, I don't see any hands going up. Alyssa, anything coming in in the questions box? Nothing in response to your questions, but a couple of other questions um not related to this particular part and we've got okay. a question on how to raise your hand um so just a reminder to go to your control panel and on that dark gray, uh, gray panel on the left there should be a place there should be a hand there where you can raise it thanks Alyssa. and if you're stuck and you can't find that hand symbol can always enter it in the questions box. Right, and um, this is Mike Norton asking, so we might be able to unmute him if, if he'd like to speak. Hey guys. Mike? There you are. Yeah, um, I'm looking here. First of all, I'm looking here and I can't find that hand deal um look at file view um be a little bit more to the left of that there's a bunch of little symbols like a telephone and a screen if you have screen share but that's usually where the little hand is located yeah i keep looking for that but did you have a, a question or a comment for us yeah so your board evaluation questionnaire um so my question was, so that doesn't contribute to board division or animosity going through that? I mean, I could see if you had kind of a some colorful personalities from different viewpoints going through that, I could see that as a, as a tool to be gamed, to mess with other people. Um, and I don't know. I was just curious about that. You obviously you have you you have it relatively new, and and I was just curious what your experience with that, you know, seeing personality types around that. Yeah, um, I can speak to that. This is the first year we've done it. So 2020 was the was the first year we did the board evaluation. Um, we 
we did roll it out as anonymous. Um, so of course, you know, the responses were going into myself and the other board members, but we didn't have any um, issue. It actually led to some really constructive conversation. I think it led to uh, folks uh, being able to talk about some things that were going on in the background that otherwise wouldn't have been talked about. And I can see, um, yeah, it helped get some of the elephants in, in, you know, in the room identified, but we didn't have anything negative come out of it. Like I said, that data was just going back to um, all the board members and myself could see it live. And I think um, anything that a board member, you know, has concerns about, it's better for them to get it out there and have it as a, an opportunity for full conversation and discussion with the full board. And that's what we did. We ran through the board evaluation dashboard after all the data was collected and we went through each item and talked about it and talked about any questions or concerns. So that was our experience. I'm not sure if Shauna or Sarah have other examples of- Well, can I, can I have a follow-up question to that? Mm -hmm. So, by the way, I, I agree with you, getting the elephant in the room is the right way to way to do things. Um, it's hard to do, but, and hard to deal with, but it's, in my experience, that's always the best thing to have happen. Um, but, do, so my follow-up question is, do, right now your current board, do they relatively, they pretty much get along with each other? They do, yes, yeah. Okay, that's probably why that worked pretty well yeah that's that is good um i i would say we did certainly have some of our challenge our own challenges last year um and i think that um those did come out in our board evaluation in some of the scores and some of the comments but it did again give us a, a constructive conversation or i guess a tool to wrap the conversation around so there it wasn't all it wasn't all um dreamy and and uh and positive there were definitely some hard issues that we tackled and it still ended up being a good tool for that yeah because i've had a um i've had a divided board before where two supervisors were on one side completely and two supervisors were completely on the other side and one that just played neutral all the time because they didn't want to be the deciding factor and um, i don't think that that survey would have benefited this situation very well but I could see a lot of those questions are good questions to be asking. Yeah, and we, you know, we have not, we never had any governance policies or a board evaluation um, as long as I've been around. This is the first time we've had governance policies or an annual evaluation required. So um, I don't know what others folks experiences, but it, I think it's it's going to be positive for us overall just to keep us all on the same page. Yeah, we have a governance governance policy, which we didn't before, uh, but due to things that happened, it was really helpful to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and I strongly encourage people to, to, if they don't have one, to develop it. Um, but I've only, out of the whole time I've been here, I've only had one supervisor ask that maybe they should evaluate their performance. Mm -hmm. And it, I think that most supervisors didn't want to take the time to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the, the key to that, Mike, is um, that we're not asking them to evaluate themselves or each other uh, individually. We're asking them to evaluate their performance as a as a body. Right, and that's, that's what I meant, yeah. The distinction there, Jennifer. And thanks, Mike. Uh, really, really uh, glad you shared that perspective. I wanna wrap us up here and, and then still hang around for some additional questions and comments. I do uh, see your hand up, Zora. We're gonna come back to you here in just a moment. So on governance, I just wanna ask everyone to remember, it's a, it's a structure, it's a system, and you determine what that system is for your district. So I, I did put a, a link in the chat to, there are some sample policies and more on governance out on the commission's website. Pick and choose what would work for you right, from those. Those are just some general samples for you. All benefit from strong governance. So both board and staff and how that whole organization functions as a unit. It's a two-way street. Know your policies. If you're wondering to yourself, wow, this is a new situation, or I'm not quite sure how to handle this, ask yourself right off the bat, what does our policy say? 
make sure to go there and follow your policy. Make a personal commitment to have a conversation. Maybe it's just a conversation with your supervisor, or if you're a manager, maybe have a conversation with your board. Is this a road that your district would like to travel uh, and do some more work around governance? And then hold yourselves and each other accountable. Whatever you bite off, whichever direction you go with governance, follow what you set out for yourselves. So I just wanted to reinforce a few of those things before we get to some questions today. So if you're extremely baffled, lost, puzzled, confused, or unclear, now is your chance. Uh, we can certainly check the questions box if there have been things entered in there, or um, do raise your hand if you want to chime in uh, verbally as well. Now's the chance, and you can certainly ask Jennifer or Sarah uh, questions about their experiences too. Zora, looks like you're self-muted. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, there you go. Okay, I apologize. There is a leaf blower directly outside my window, but it's too much to type. So I have two questions and they're related. Um, as, as I've been with the districts, I've witnessed this shift from district boards and it's not a complete shift. It's just kind of a general trend of district boards being the driver of our ship to them being more advisory. And I'm really curious for both of you and anybody else, how, how did you drill down to what your board's actual goals were in terms of that, that, that kind of shift or what the goal was for how they lead? Obviously, that's a big question. So that's my first question. And then I, I guess I'll just ask the second one, which is um, as a, a pretty small district, things like really big policy changes, like what um, y'all are talking about, they're pretty disproportionately burdensome for smaller districts. They're so important and I see how important they are, but it's just very hard for smaller districts to be able to manage getting to that point. And I'm curious if there's any kind of efforts to offer some kind of standardization. And I know people's hackles just went up, but offer standardization from either the commission or WACD or something, not requirement, not you must do this, but you know, here are some good best practices that are maybe a little more along the lines of what we've seen in this presentation today. Thank you. Well, Zora, I'll go to your second question first, if I may. And there are a, a sample set of policies out there. Uh, they're not actually anything that the commission necessarily sanctioned or put together. We pulled those from Endurance. Um, so those have been shared with all kinds of different organizations like conservation districts. And uh, uh, not really standardization, but best practices. So there will be parts and pieces in those sample policies that you'll look at that at your district and go, that doesn't really fit for us. We don't need to put that in our in our governance policies, and that's fine. Um, and additional support. So if you work with your regional manager, you can contact me as well. I'm happy to do a similar kind of workshop that I've done for flu CD in the past with any district that is interested in that or assisting your local regional manager to do that with you, right? It's really a conversation about what will work best for your district. And if it's working great now, that's wonderful. Now's the time to memorialize how it's working great in your governance policies to hopefully keep it on that smooth sail, right? So that's, that's your second question. I think your first question might be better uh, addressed by maybe Jennifer or Sarah, if they have any thoughts around that. Yeah, hi, this is Sarah. Uh, Dora, can you can you repeat that your first question again? I started thinking about your second one a lot and I forgot what the first one was. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I'm I've witnessed this kind of shift from the the C D boards as really driving the ship of conservation districts to being much more 
um, advisory and policy based. And that obviously is very different from district to district. And there's all kinds of extremes. But how did you both drill down with your boards where on that continuum they wanted to be? Yeah, I think that is definitely um, as a hot button topic right there, because as soon as your organization swings in one direction, you're one election or one appointment away from it swinging back the other way really quickly. And so depending on the different boards and personality types, you, your organization might shift really dramatically from one to the other. And so to make sure that you're not sort of dragged along as as the district manager or as the organization as a whole, or the staff or the programs behind that um, volatility and governance, having those really specific delegations of authority and policy has been really helpful for us. Um, those, of course, can always be changed by the board, um, but you know the, it takes a lot more effort, like you mentioned, to go through and, and revise and review and develop and change policy, and it takes a vote of the board, you know, as a whole to move through that process. And so having more of that framework in your policy that really clearly spells out those roles and responsibilities um, I think is really helpful. I will also say that, um, you know, something that Jennifer mentioned in the Aspen Group presentation that was brought to um, WACD a while ago, um, they really mentioned focusing on the liability angle too when you're looking into developing those roles and responsibilities within your policy, really from both the board side and from the district manager side, what roles and responsibilities are best in either of those houses to limit and reduce risk. So a lot of personnel management stuff is best in, you know, the district manager house because of liability issues with, with the different board members coming in and, and offering other types of guidance or um, not understanding all of the state law considerations for um, managing public employees, as an example. Um, and, you know, a lot of the financial considerations and policies and roles and responsibilities are within the, the district board wheelhouse. And we limit a lot of risk as employees, you know, making those types of decisions by putting them there. So understanding it, I think, from that angle is really helpful. I think Enduris would be able to help unpack that to some degree, too. And then I think once you can look at and identify, these are my priorities as a district manager, these are your priorities as a board, it's easier to see, you know, how we fit together. It's easier to see if there's space made for both of us or all of us. Um, and if we can stay in those buckets and, and do our piece of the job, the whole puzzle, you know, the whole pie is done. Um, so that's really helpful. But I ask my board all the time. I think during my personal evaluation process and my mid-year evaluation process, I send back to the board, I want to know these things. From you I want I, you know I would love guidance on these things as well how do you feel about the way I do this and communication is always at the top of that list are you receiving enough information do you want to be more involved in something how can I help you know you leave your legacy as a volunteer and and help um, you know you feel like you are fully functioning as a supervisor and so it it helps inform me about the nuances of different board member priorities, but it also helps create those conversations, I think, between all of the leadership um, of our of our district. So those are a couple of of my thoughts on that, but I'd be happy to talk with you more too, Zora. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thanks, Zora. Any questions coming in in the questions box? Let's take a quick look over there. Yeah, we have a question asking if these kind of evaluations um, are open to the public or staff. Hmm, board evaluation? Is that the reference, I wonder? Um, I'm guessing so. Yes, got confirmation on that, board evaluation. Okay. Jennifer, how do you handle the board evaluations at Blue CD? Are those open to public or open to the staff? Yeah, so the board evaluation is conducted internally. The only uh, folks who are invited to participate in the board evaluation, at least the way we structured it this year, were the five 
board members themselves. But then we did have a work session to review the board evaluation, and that was done at an open public meeting. Um, we didn't see anything that would allow us to do that in executive session like you can do a staff performance review in executive session, but the board uh, review was actually done in, in the public meeting. And we have not, yeah, we have not pursued doing it as like a 360 type evaluation from um, with other folks participating in the actual evaluation at this point. Thanks, Jennifer. Anything else coming in in the questions box? Um, there is another question asking for a link to the policies. Um, I kind of lost track who was thinking, speaking at this point um, with the policies that were mentioned. Um, I know, Shauna, you've got a link um, in the chat box um, trying to get some confirmation here. But were, were there, I might have missed it, were there any other policies mentioned that we can provide a link to? I don't think so. I think that was me referencing uh, those samples that we have posted up on the commission's webpage, you're looking for the uh, accountability operations and training, and there is a link pasted into the chat box. So check your chat box. There's a link there for you to follow to those samples. Okay. And Great. Okay. Kind of one more, well, a few questions asking um, Jennifer to share um, the evaluation. And um, should they just contact you directly, Jennifer? Yeah, that would be that would be fine. Um, and and then if they have SmartSheet, I can actually put it in our district workspace and just share the whole template set. And if they don't, then I can um, just send a PDF of, of it. Wait, I want to check real quickly. Mike Jordan, you still have your hand up. Did you uh, have another question or another comment? If not, just put your hand down. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and unmute you. Looks like you're self-muted. Okay. And we've got one more yes. question here, if we've got time, Shauna. We do. Let's make this the last one and then wrap up. I, I don't want to cut too much into everyone's lunch break. Sure. Do you both incorporate your board policies into your general policy manual? Yes. Um, this is the, like I said, we've never had board policies before, so, um, but we decided to leave it as part of our regular policy manual. And the way we structured our policy manual is the whole fir first section, it kind of applies to everybody in the organization, whether you're a board member or a staff member. So we kind of have things together and then we have a separate governance section as well. And then of course, separate uh, sections that are just relevant to staff. Or just set up the same or in a very similar fashion. 